So we've got these three puzzles about the universe. How are we going to solve them? Well, there's a situation where the particle physicists come in, and they've got two fundamental principles they often use. That's right. So if you ever meet a particle physicist, they're really into two things. One is simplicity. Well, not simple maybe in the traditional form of the word, very complicated mathematically, but simple in terms of the way it works the same everywhere, for example. And symmetry. Symmetry is the idea of how things can sort of look the same in any situation. And Paul will talk a little bit more about this. Yeah, so the part of simplicity that matters here is that <coughs> we know there are four forces of nature. Electromagnetism, which holds our bodies together. Strong force holds nuclei atoms together. The weak force, which we talked about in course three in terms of neutrinos interacting with matter. And gravity. Now, to a particle physicist, this is too many. A universe with four forces, that's your four lots of equations that have to be memorized. That's, there that's should only be one. Yes. One rule. One rule. And so they naturally thought that maybe there's some way of combining these, at least the, the first three of these forces. Gravity turns out to be very hard to combine with yeah. the other ones. Uh, this already happened in the 19th century. There was electricity and magnetism, which were previously seen as two forces, had been unified by Maxwell and other people. So maybe we could do something else and combine these three forces. So that's the notion of simplicity, is you may have to work in 11 dimensions to get all four things to work together and have horrifically complex mathematics, but then you would have one rule. That's the simplicity we're yes. after. So s simple rules of the mathematics may be horrific, and in fact usually is in these situations. Yeah. And back in the 1970s, a group of people came up with theories that would actually combine at least the first three th forces. They're called gauge field theories or Yang-Mills fields. And the idea is that there's a field, this gauge field or the Higgs field, which permeates space and it tells particles how to behave. If it had a, a value of zero, all the forces would act the same on a particle. So in fact, there wouldn't be four forces, there would only be one. But if the gauge field has a particular different value, that means that it reacts differently to charge and to color and to, um, it therefore behaves like the forces are all different. Right. So it's these the forces are all really the same, but there's this mysterious, invisible, unobservable field that permeates space that makes it act different. Right, and normally we think of sort of the energy state of the universe as being the thing that sort of tells this single thing how to behave. And at low energies, like we're at right now, we've got these three, and gravity fits in there somehow, we're not quite sure how yet. But when the universe is very young, maybe they acted as one. So that's simplicity, and that's how it fits in. Can we fit these, four, these forces together? And we've got these gauge field theories to do that. Then we get to symmetry. Now, symmetry is something that's taught in <coughs> every primary school, and normally it's taught purely in geometrical terms. For example, this is a symmetrical shape because you flip it over this way or flip it over that way, it looks the same. You but can to even rotate this by uh, you know, so many, so many degrees, one-fifth of a circle. And it will look the same. Yeah. But to a physicist, we have a more general definition of symmetry. This is the idea that you have a transformation, something that changes things, and if you change things but they remain the same, that's a symmetry. Right. So in this case, one transformation would be to flip it, and it remains the same, so it's got a symmetry. Likewise, the rotation by one-fifth of a circle. That's a transformation, but it remains the same, so it's a symmetry. But there are other examples of this. Perhaps the best one is translational symmetry. If I do an experiment here, I move over here and do the same experiment, there's been a transformation I've moved, but the laws of physics and hence the results of the experiment are the same. This turns out to be very useful. The world would be a very funny place if that were not true. And we often use that in determining these laws that that is true. You need it to be true because reality as we know it would fall apart if it were not true. Yes, and we used this in the previous course <laughs> to deal with uh, relativity. Right. And in fact, it turns out that if you make this assumption that all the laws of physics are symmetrical under translation, that moving doesn't change anything, you can actually derive Newton's laws of motion and the conservation of momentum from that. Right. Likewise, we have time symmetry. If I do an experiment now, and I do it a week from now, the laws of physics should be the same. That's a symmetry in time. The transformation is going forward through time. The experiments are the same, so it's a symmetry, and it turns out you can deduce energy conservation from that. This is one of the advantages of physics over, for example, economics, which my wife studies, where the experiments turn out to change over time because people change. makes it much, much harder. Okay, so we have these two fundamental principles that uh, particle physicists like, symmetry and simplicity. The trouble is there's a bit of a conflict between them here. Yeah. We've just talked about unifying all these forces. Uh, 
So we've got one force that can behave like lots of different things. And that seems almost like to violate symmetry. Why should it choose to behave like this rather than behave like that? Right, so we sort of need to have something where it doesn't really act symmetrically yeah. at some point. And it turns out uh, there is an example we can get from a quite different area of physics, which is uh, solid state physics that okay. can help explain these things. This is called s uh, spontaneous mm -hmm. symmetry breaking. And the idea is that you can mm -hmm. have symmetrical laws of physics which have non-symmetrical, asymmetrical results. And the example would be a crystal. We always think of crystals as prime examples of symmetry. But in a crystal, all the atoms are lined up in particular directions. But why one direction rather than another? Mm, yeah. It kind of seems like a crystal has to make an arbitrary decision. Why am I going to go that direction rather than that direction? Yes, yeah, so let's right. say you take, for example, water, and you <coughs> cool it down until it goes below freezing, and then it has to form crystals. The crystals will have to pick a direction to line up. Why one direction rather than randomly as they were before? That seems almost to violate symmetry. Right. And the way we explain this is with an energy diagram, what's called a Mexican hat energy diagram. I don't know if this, uh, Mexicans actually wore hats with quite this big a brim, but... Ah, uh, yeah, it's a sombrero which sort of loses, you know, goes out of control on the edge. So the idea is that, let's say you have a water molecule, you can point, line up this way or that way. In yeah. reality, it would be a three-dimensional thing, you can point anyway, but let's simplify, you can say, either line up that way or line yeah. up that way. Yep. And here's the energy, depending which way it's lined up. So it, it turns out that when you're water, your energy level is up here, and that means it can be pointing any way, and it will jump back and forth between this as the atoms yep. jostle around. So it'll be going it doop, 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 depending on where it is here in this diagram. Yep. That's because the energy level is up here, but let's say you cool everything down, the energy level of the water goes down until eventually at zero, it hits here. Now you call it below zero, this is no longer really possible. It has to make up its mind. It has to go either one way or the other. Now this is a symmetrical... Mexican hat. It's not like any realistic Mexican hat I've ever seen. It's very symmetrical. But it forces the water to make a decision. It has to go one way or go the other. And in fact, if you cool down a bit of water or crystallize something as a solution, you'll find that different bits go different ways. There might be one bit over here that starts forming a crystal pointing that way, one bit over here that forms a crystal pointing this way. And then you get these really cool structures where you get sort of a crystal and a crystal coming together at different angles. Not so much in water, but you'll see that in, for example, salt crystals and things. Yeah. And that's where one thing has literally broken the symmetry one direction and another bit a different direction. And they eventually have to come together. And it turns out this idea of a Mexican hat energy diagram and spontaneous symmetry breaking is going to be fundamental to explaining our cosmological conundrums.